Hi, good morning, everyone. Real pleasure to be here to, to talk about this topic um, because it's the first time at this conference. There's a lot of a lot of experience in the room, a lot of knowledge in the room. I don't uh, pretend to have any any more than, than you do. Certainly on on the experience side. Um, so if you have questions, please jump in. Comments, observations, uh, just just feel free to, to jump in here with those. Um, so I, I, for those of you who don't know me, I've been at Virginia Tech for four seasons, based in Blacksburg now. Uh, so I don't know if that makes me, me new or not, but um, do the typical uh, extension weed specialist stuff, a lot of herbicides, a lot of herbicide resistance, and those types of things. Uh, this, is, this is a fun project, but I don't want you to think that this, this new guy at Tech is kind of off the wall and, and doesn't, not, not familiar with the reality of production agriculture. Um, I, I, I'd like to think I am, but maybe not. But, but I was harvest weed seed control, and certainly this is something I think we need in weed management is, is another tool, right? Something else, uh, certainly our herbicides, various reasons uh, aren't giving us the control that they were, were 10 years ago. Uh, so, so this could be a potential tool that we want to explore and look at uh, in our operations. All right, so we're going to get into to why. I mentioned a little bit about that. Um, what is harvest weed seed control? How does it work? I think I can answer those questions. Uh, does it work is, is a question that the response is going to be the classic, uh, it depends and we need more research extension answer, right? But uh, I think you'll see some of the nuances as, as we get into that there. Uh, talk about some, some costs and, and then some tips and things that, that I've learned uh, to how to make this work or, or maybe more often than not how, how to screw it up, how to, what not to do, right? Um, so, so that's where we're going. Uh, so why harvest weed seed control? Uh, Palm Ramworth has really changed the game on this, right? Uh, certainly this isn't our only herbicide resistant weed, but it's, it's one that can aggressively take over a field in a, in a very short time period. Um, it's, it's basically driven us away from economic thresholds to one plant is one too many, right? We have this zero tolerance policy, and we've, we've advocated in a lot of situations for hand removal, right? hand pulling weeds, which no one is excited about, and I'm, you know, I don't really like saying it in front of people because it's, you know, it's kind of, kind of a, a tough, tough sell, right? Uh, certainly in a field like this, we can do that, right? Um, it, are you guys pulling these types of weeds or, or seeing you guys doing it? Some yes, right? E every time? Yeah, I've, I've driven a combine through something like that, right? <laughs> um, so, so sometimes we're pulling this type of situation, sometimes we're not. What about this kind of situation, right? Um, certainly we could have made some better decisions. Uh, we could execute a little better before we get to this point. Um, but, but nonetheless, this happens some, some years, right? Even, even to some, some producers that I think are pretty good producers. Uh, you know, weather, equipment, those kinds of things can get in our way. It's, it's not going to be economical to try to go out there and hand pull that, certainly at least that year, right? Now, uh, I don't know if you've heard the, the, the one year, uh, the, this year seeds make next year's weeds, right? Or one year seeds makes 10 years weeds. You know, maybe hand pulling that could pay for itself over the next five years or so, but it's it's a real tough sell, right? When you're when you're standing there looking at it on a, on a larger field, um, but that's that's the opportunity we might have with harvest weed seed controls is, is to try to do something about that, right? Because what happens with it is those weeds mature, they produce seed, and then uh, like in this situation, there's the the dark spots there are common ragweed in the soybean field. And this was in Southside Virginia, but I saw some of that driving up the shore yesterday. Uh, and we're running the combine through there, right? And what's the combine doing to those weed seeds? It's going to spread them out, right? It's going to go from uh, within that field, from one field to the next, to, and one farm to the next. Certainly we know that that is the major route of dispersal for our, our herbicide resistant weeds. Uh, certainly, you know, they might be like horse weeds going to blow around in the air, but palmer and common ragweed, mostly what's happening is, is we are moving it on our equipment, whether we want to own up to that, that fact or not. So common ragweed's early to emerge, and so you can see it before the burn down goes out, and that's within the, in these bottom two pictures, is you see all that common ragweed coming up in these strips, right? And that's just where it fell out of the back of the combine uh, from that previous year's harvest. And if you don't do anything about it, you get what happens, or, or don't do it, anything effective to it, you get the, the top picture, right, where all those rows are out there uh, because we sprayed Roundup in a uh, Roundup-resistant uh, weed population, right? And so, so these rows are maybe a little closer together than you guys. In, in Southside Virginia, typical, we have 15-foot headers is, is not uncommon just because of the rolling terrain and that kind of thing. And that's, that's what you see here. Um, 
So that, but that presents an opportunity for us to try to do something with those weed seeds at harvest time. You look at the literature, that, and this has been well documented in the literature, they had one palm rate at the scape that they simulated. At the end of the season in 2007, 2008, you see where it was detected in, in this field, uh, mainly at that point of origin, but a little bit down here. Um, the following year, large streak through the field, right? That's when we typically notice there's a problem. We don't execute effectively. The year after that was a total crop loss. Could not harvest the field. Uh, so, so we've seen that. We've seen that the combine is dragging it, it through the field. All right. We also know for some of these weeds, though, that if we, with good management, we can really effectively reduce that weed seed bank and getting it, get it down to a manageable level in two, three, certainly within four years. So this is an example uh, from Alan York a few years back at, at NC State. And this picture, the whole field was treated alike uh, in 2009, which is when, what you're looking at here, right? But certainly there's a difference of what's going on in that field. And, and what the difference was is what crop that field was in the previous year, the foreground, it was in tobacco, right? So high value crops, some tillage in there, hand labor to hand pull weeds, uh, really effective uh, weed management there the year before. The back was in soybean, probably less than uh, a total effective weed management. And you can see the result from a seed bank and what happened there the following year. We've also seen that in some of my research at, at Virginia Tech, the, uh, our soybean board funded this, uh, this project to look at what happens if we get out of some of this continuous soybean uh, that we're in. Um, could we could we rotate through grain sorghum, uh, you know, so same same day basically we can drill it just like we drill beans, we can harvest it with a grain header just like we do beans, uh, but it opens up a lot more herbicide options for us to try to effectively manage the palmer amaranth in that. So, so what happens if we go through one year of grain sorghum and then back to soybeans versus just continuous soybeans? And what we found was, was that that seed bank was really reduced uh, when we came back to soybeans. And so we had about 20,000 plants per acre uh, come up there where we, we had gone through sorghum. When we kept it in beans and didn't have good weed management, we had almost 60,000 plants per acre, right? So over a three-fold decrease in just, just one year of, of effective management. So if we can target those seeds at, at harvest time, then, then I think we can, we can uh, have some progress here. So that's what, what harvest weed seed controls is trying to turn uh, the harvesters, this combine here, from a dispersal of weed seeds into uh, a predator, if you will, of, of weed seeds, right? It's going to try to kill or remove uh, those weed seeds with the harvest operation. Uh, there's there's several ways to do that. Uh, we'll look into that. But the, the, the first one, the, the original, uh, was the Harrington Seed Destructor. So Ray Harrington is a farmer in Australia that came up with this idea um, and really kind of pioneered it and, and worked with some companies, uh, equipment manufacturers, to, to make this uh, this device here, which is the Harrington Seed Destructor. So this was in response to herbicide resistance. They've got a, a, a rigid ryegrass population in Australia that they cannot control with herbicides anymore. It's either the herbicides never were effective on it or it's developed resistance to all the other ones that they had uh, uh, as options for them. So they got something to manage weeds or they got to get out of farming, right? And so this is, this is the way it was, can, can we use this device to try to kill uh, weeds with the harvest or weed seeds with the harvest operation. So ideally, uh, if the combine's set up right, most of those weed seeds are going to come off the off of the combine in the chaff fraction, right? So you've got the grain fraction on the grain hopper, you've got the straw fraction that's going to go through that chopper spreader, and you've got the chaff fraction that's either falling out of the back of the combine or, or being spread out uh, behind it. So but the chaff fraction goes into a cage mill. And that's just physically uh, destroying those seeds. It's just, uh, it's not really pulverizing them into a powder, but it's just nicking them and bopping them on the head basically until they're dead um, and, and not viable. And then so that just gets spread out behind the, uh, the combine. So, so basically we're, we're just moving the straw, the straw fraction and chopper spreader to the back of this trailer. Uh, and then the, the, the chaff is going through this mill first. Okay? So the weed seeds are get into the machine. Uh, that fraction is, is destroyed. Okay, so we, uh, um, there is one of these at, at USDA facility in, in Beltsville here. It's actually working. Has anyone seen the video or the presentation? Alright, um, so this is one that's in, in Beltsville, uh, and I'm part of a, a grant there for the USDA ARS uh, area-wide team looking at integrated weed management. So this is one of the things that, that we've looked at there. So you can see it uh, in action. 
at, at a commercial scale, which is important. Okay, but before we really get into that, there's there's a couple things we got to talk about before we get to uh, does this work and what are the other types of harvest weed seed control. First, we've got to recognize that we've got to have those seeds on the plant at harvest time. All right? If the seeds have already shattered off the plant, they're on the ground, the combine is not a vacuum, it's not going to suck up the, what's on the soil surface. Um, so the plant has to have, or the seeds have to be retained on that plant at, at harvest time. They've got to be above that cutter bar to get into the machine, right? Uh, so when you look at the literature to see what uh, the fraction of the seed retained at harvest time, it's pretty good for Palmer. You know, 95 or, or better uh, percentage-wise is retained at harvest time. Uh, so that looks like a good target. Red root pigweed, uh, 66%, uh, maybe not so much, right? If, if we can only kill 66% uh, of the seeds out there, is that enough to, to affect uh, change uh, moving forward? Um, common water hemp, not much of a problem around here, although there, there's pockets of it in Virginia, certainly a bigger problem in the Midwest. Again, a lot of seed retention there. Uh, common lambs quarters has 90% seed retention, so it may be another good target. Uh, but barnyard grass, perhaps not so much. Uh, so the way we, we've measured these, at least in our studies experimentally, is what you see here in this picture. Uh, we, we plant some weeds in the soybean crop, and once those weeds start flowering, we basically get rid of the soybean canopy that's around it, put down the trays, and then we go to those trays and we, we vacuum those up uh, weekly. I'm not going to say we got all the seeds, but we, we certainly, that was the goal, is to get all the seeds uh, off the plant. Um, so what we saw, and this is one year's data, there's, there's a lot, we have some more data to add to this from this uh, 2017, and then this is going to be combined with a lot of other uh, uh, universities doing this type of research with that area-wide funded team. But just to, to, to kind of point, make a point about timing is here, this is our six weed species, so red root, pigweed, ragweed, lands quarters, cocklebur, uh, and a couple grasses. And we divided this up into timing. So as soon as it started flowering, we put out our seed trays and we, we monitored those every, every week uh, for the duration of the experiment, right? Once the soybeans were first ready to be harvested, we, we marked that date and then we continued our weekly uh, harvest for three more weeks, right? Because we don't always get to that field and harvest it as soon as the field's ready, right? Certainly this year is, is exhibit A of not being able to get a timely harvest accomplished, right? Um, so there, and there's various reasons for that, that that you're all aware of, right? So if we had a harvest, losing some of those weed seeds off the plants as, as a rainstorm moves through, as time passes, as a breeze blows. Um, and so that's, so we, so that's what's in the green. That's and at the end of that, we, took, we, just, we just cut the mother plant off, stuffed it in a bag, and went back and, and threshed those seeds out, right? Uh, and that's what's in the red bar. So that was retained uh, through harvest and through, through a three-week harvest delay. And so what we found here was, in, in our data, red root pigweed is a little better than 66%. You know, we were getting somewhere almost 88% almost was retained uh, at harvest. Um, and so that would be the combination of the, the, the sorry, was, yeah, retained, was, re, yeah, retained at harvest. So that's the combination of both of these. Um, but if we waited three weeks, we lost about 14% of that, right? And so getting a timely harvest is important because we got to recognize that as the longer we wait, the fewer seeds are going to be on that plant and the, the less effectiveness these types of approaches are going to have, right? Something certainly like, like common lambs quarters, uh, we had a lot right there at harvest, but we started to lose a lot of it really quickly. You look at the grass species, and, and maybe we didn't have as much as we need to to, to make this a viable target for those, those weed species. All right, what about wheat? So there's... There's some data on the, the, the weeds that we have in wheat. Uh, right, rigid ryegrass is what they have in Australia that this system was basically based on. And they're seeing 80 to 96% retention at, at wheat harvest there in Australia for rigid ryegrass. We don't have that species. We have its, its cousin Italian ryegrass. Um, the data there is 58%. Um, and then certainly you see some other weeds that we have. Downy brome, this, this research was conducted in, in Colorado, so at least a little bit closer to home, right? Um, so you see, but it, but it varies quite a bit, you know, and, and again, what you're seeing at 40 to 96%, a timely harvest could make the difference between whether that's going to work or not work. Okay, so we've got to recognize that, that, um, that the seed's got to be on the plant. The other thing we have to recognize is that we're only eliminating returns to the seed bank. We're not, we're not taking anything out of the weed seed bank, right? So uh, the weed seeds that are there from previous years uh, are still going to come up that next year, right? Uh, and so if we're trying to exhaust a weed seed bank through time by eliminating seed return, 
uh, we need to look at weeds that are, are going to be exhaustible in a reasonable amount of time. And so by that I mean if you look at common lambs quarters, you only see 50% reduction in the weed seed bank in 12 years, right? That's not, that's not really anything to get excited about. If, if we're going through all this trouble and, and 12 years later we, we may have had a 50% reduction, right? Um, but, but pigweed, common ragweed, and these grass species, you know, less than three years we can get half of that gone. Uh, the research out of Georgia and Palmer Amaranth is, is we can get 85% seed mortality uh, for, for Palmer in three years. Uh, so, so certainly there's some targets there uh, of economic interest for harvest weed seed control. Any questions about that? Okay, so let's kind of go back to the, the, the types of harvest weed seed control and, and the Harrington seed destructor here. Uh, the first thing I think anyone notices is this is a, a big trailer, right? And, and pulling one of these around our fields in this part of the world, you know, it's going to be easier in some fields than others, but it's not going to be very uh, uh, easy to do in all of our fields. So this is, this is not where this technology is going. That's, you can't actually buy the, the trailer um, unit anymore. Where it's going is an integrated uh, Harrington seed destructor. So we're losing the trailer. Uh, we're, we're changing some plumbing and some parts on the back of the combine. Uh, and, and we're going to use some of the, the combine's own power source for this, right? And so what this looks like is going to be is just like an add-on at the dealer, you know, probably not in the next two, three, four, five years, but somewhere online this would be like an add-on option at the dealers where I, I think this is going to go, right? But you can, you can order this. Um, it's, it's been difficult to get these in the States. It's more available in Australia. and Certainly they're still ramping up production of, of, of these units. Um, but, you know, it looks pretty much like the regular back end of combine, but you're not, uh, the seeds that are coming out of that, uh, at least in the chaff fraction, are, are being killed by that. So that's the, the integrated herring seed destructor. Um, it's using about 80 horsepower to, to run that. So you're going to need uh, some, that's, that's something to consider with your combine, right? If you're running that thing wide open using every pony she's got, then we don't have 80, 80 to spare for this. Uh, but if you're running it wide open, uh, as you know, we're, we're sprinting grain out of the back of the machine and we're not operating as efficiently as we, we could be, right? And so grain's coming out of the back of the machine, dollar bills are coming out of the back of the machine. Uh, but if you, so if you're running it where it is uh, optimal harvest efficiency, you should have 80 horsepower to spare is, is what the, the engineers tell me. That being said, you know as well as I do, we can, we can ship a diesel engine, we can re reprogram the computer to get more, more horsepower out of it. So to me, that's, I think we can, we can overcome that hurdle. It's not something that, co that concerns me too much. But, but a concern that, that's out there nonetheless. There's a, a competing uh, product, the Seed Terminator. Um, so uh, and, and they both seem to be equally effective. Uh, I think just the actual mechanics of the mills are a little bit different, but they both seem to control weed seeds that have gone into them uh, over 90%. So there's, there's a couple different competitors there on the market for that. All right, so what are the, the pros and cons uh, of this? And some of these are relative, as you'll see, to some of the other uh, forms of harvest weed seed control. But, but one thing is, is we are completely returning the residue to the field, right? And that's important for our no-till systems. There's a lot of nutrients uh, and carbon and, and therefore some value in that residue being returned to the field and, and evenly distributed, right? So that's, that's something in its favor. There's nothing to do after harvest. Once, once you're done, you're done. You don't have to go back out there. Some of these other types of harvest weed seed control we'll talk about have some, some extra steps to do after harvest. It's very, and it's very effective at, at killing the weed seeds. Uh, the cons are it's, it's expensive. Um, so this, that unit there installed I think was $120,000. Um, where they think the integrated unit is going is going to be somewhere between forty dollars and $50,000 once they ramp up manufacturing. But right now it's about a hundred dollars to $120,000 price tag for the, the IHSD as well. Because we need more horsepower, we're going to burn some more fuel. That's a cost we need to consider. Um, and, and just another con is, is if we're trying to har estimate our harvest losses, right, the amount of, of grain we're losing out of the back of the machine, it's all being killed in this mill. And so uh, it, it can be difficult to estimate harvest losses if, if we're doing that uh, through what's coming out of the back of the combine. OK. Another way to do this is with a chaff cart. And so this is not unlike the harvest weed seed control, except that instead of uh, putting that chaff through the mill, you're just putting it in a big uh, bucket on this trailer that's running through the, through the uh, field behind the combine. And then you, you know, uh, depending on how big your field is or, or kind of how you want to make this work, you can either just dump that in a big pile in the field, uh, come back and burn it, 
uh, or you can just haul it off the field and off the edge and, and just, just dump it there uh, and, and move on with it. So uh, again, the, the, chaff, the straw fraction here is being spread out and we're only targeting that, that chaff fraction. All right, so we're not going to get around pulling a trailer over this kind of uh, thing. You know, this piece of equipment costs money. The, if, if you just kind of take the Australian estimates and convert those to American dollars, you know, somewhere $50,000 price tag for that piece of equipment, assuming you can, you can find one. I, I don't know if they're available or not. I, I haven't gone shopping for one, but I think that might be a custom, uh, a custom build there with where we are right now. Uh, you might need to come back and burn the dumps, and certainly we're removing some nutrients uh, and, the and some of the residue with that. So for a typical wheat your, uh, harvest, you're looking at about 15% of, of that residue is going to be chaff. And so we're, if we're going to remove it, uh, that's a consideration that, that we need to take, take into account. The pros, uh, if you've got animals in your system and, and can graze these chaff dumps, there can be some value there as far as nutrient and animal gain and, and that kind of productivity. Certainly that's a logistical uh, challenge. Um, and we also need to recognize that if we're trying to remove weed seeds from the field and then we feed it to these animals and they go around and spread it back out over the field, um, there's some, that's something to consider, right? It may, may not be uh, doing uh, our desired effect by doing that. Uh, and another thing is it's, it's a minimal uh, residue removal. All right. The next one, and, and maybe a little bit more fun, I think it's a little bit easier to adopt, is, is narrow windrow burning. So the idea here is, is, is you're taking the, the chopper and spreader of the chaff fraction and the chaff, or sorry, the straw fraction and the chaff fraction, and you're just dropping that right combine in, in a narrow windrow. Uh, ideally, this is about 10% of the width of your header. So if you've got a 30-foot header, you want to get this down to three feet or less. If you've got a 15-foot header, a foot and a half or less. Um, and so that, all of that material drops down onto the, to the ground there, and then you just you burn that windrow, right? And so that's um, the, the idea there is that you're, you're concentrating the fuel uh, within that windrow. So compared to burning a whole field like, like we used to do and maybe still do in some parts of the world, uh, we're concentrating that heat around the seed, and we're having a, so we're getting more heat and a higher duration of that heat compared with, with burning the whole field, and that seems to be uh, pretty effective at, at killing weed seeds. We've looked at this in Virginia, um, and so one of the things we've we've got to get it hot enough to kill the weed seeds, and we're we're trying to do some killing experiments where we can figure out okay, what temperature do we need to get to to kill palm ramrath, to kill common ragweed, et cetera. We don't really have those data, but if you just kind of look at uh, the literature that's out there on, on weed seeds in general, what we need to get to kill, we're trying to reach about 300 degrees Celsius, and so when you when you look at where that is with with wheat uh, narrow windrow burning or with soybean stubble. Uh, generally, we're getting there. So these these are just peaks of of where that uh, that, that temperature probe was uh, in the windrow as the fire moved moved across it. So this has been uh, the first windrow we burned with with uh, the, the, the the blue sampler, and then that same windrow with the, with the orange sampler, a little bit different spot in the windrow. Um, so this is just through time as that fire moved down the windrow, and then we we picked up those. Uh, temperature gauges and, and moved them to different windrows as, as we burned. So generally, we were getting there. Um, if you try to do this in the morning with the dew on the, on the windrow, uh, you probably weren't going to make it. If you had a lot of green stems from weed seeds you know, in there at harvest, uh, we had some issues uh, uh, getting there as well in, in those types of situations. Uh, but if you have a, a decently clean crop, uh, we, we can get hot enough to burn uh, or hot enough to kill the weed seeds in there. So this is what we uh, just some samples we took out of those windrows for Italian ryegrass and wheat. So this was before burning. You see we were very effective at getting the Italian ryegrass into, that, um, into the windrow. And then when we sampled it after we burned, you can see we were not 100% effective in some cases here, but very effective in, in killing the weed seeds that were in that windrow. And so we're, we're working on uh, finishing out some of these studies for ragweed and for palmer as well. Okay, so narrow window burning, certainly there's some, some pros and cons with this, right? Burning uh, fields and, and keeping the fire within that field, the smoke uh, potentially blowing across our highways, um, that could be an issue, right? We started lighting these things on fire and I got a little bit nervous. Uh, one thing I would say here is, is we cut this wheat pretty high. That's typically how we cut wheat, right? Uh, you want to run less material through the combine so you can harvest faster. Um, 
that's not really how we you want to do this. You really you want to harvest low. That's going to get more of the of the straw into that windrow and more fuel in there. So it's going to again burn hotter and longer because of that. Um, but you also have less risk of escape uh, when when you do that. So what are the, the pros and cons? This is certainly I think uh, fairly easy to try out, easy to adopt. Um, it's a fairly low cost, right? Maybe 150, 200 bucks worth of uh, some, some sheet metal in an afternoon, we can outfit a combine to do this. And one of the things that uh, can be a concern is that all the weed seeds that enter the, the front of the harvester are going to end up in the windrow, right? Uh, for the HSD, the Harrington Seed Destructor, and for the chaff cart, we've got to get those seeds into the chaff fraction, which is going to require us to do some adjustments on the combine, right? And certainly we're not going to get them all. A properly adjusted combine, what they've seen in Australia, is, is over 90% of the seeds that enter the combine end up in the chaff fraction. But if you do a poor job of that and don't adjust it, you can have as much as 50% of the seeds exiting in that straw fraction, right? And so um, you don't really want to go to the trouble and expense of buying a Harrington seed destructor to only have half of what, what you're trying to get through that machine go, go through the machine. Uh, but certainly in this case, everything that gets in the front of the combine is, is that windrow except for the grain um, and, and that's going to end up uh, so that, that adjustment concern is not there. Uh, we talked about the fire and the smoke, uh, certainly nutrient removal again and the residue removal, we're burning a lot of carbon, all the nitrogen in, in that uh, stem so something like soybean might be a little more concerned than wheat, but that nitrogen is going up in the air as, as, uh, so we're losing that and that's an expense we might have to account for later in our fertilizer budget. Uh, one thing is, can we get a good burn across uh, all these windrows? Um, certainly, if you don't get a, a good burn, you're going to have a pile of residue out there, which is going to be an issue to plant through. But we're also not going to kill the weed seeds, which is what we're trying to do, right? Uh, so, and we talked about how that you know, dew and, and a lot of green material in there can make that problematic. All right. Chaff lining, we're sort of ratcheting down in terms of, of ease of adoption here. Uh, chaff lining is, is another form of harvest weed seed control. Uh, in this one, we're just dropping the chaff in this line. Uh, so the straw fraction uh, is still being chopped and spread out across the field. So we've got to get that separation of the weeds into the chaff fraction uh, that's coming out of the back of the combine. Uh, but but we're still has, we still have the spreader or the chopper spreader on there for the straw. And so what you're seeing is, is this is what's coming out of the back of the machine in the chaff. Uh, this is a picture off of Twitter. There's a lot of guys in Australia that just made their own devices. Uh, you know, this is, it looks like it's off the shelf from John Deere, at least in, in Australia. I don't know if you can find that in the, in the States yet. Uh, but there's different ways to, to adjust that, just to get that chaff to drop uh, right in a line. And so this one, we're not actually killing or, or really removing the seeds, but we are concentrating them in a row, right? And so they're going to compete with themselves. Um, and we're sort of sacrificing an area, but generally that's less than 5% than of the field area. So uh, versus spreading those weed seeds out back across the whole field, they're going to compete with more of, of the crop uh, by doing this. So there's limited research on whether this effective, is effective. We haven't, uh, at least my group hasn't looked at this in the, here in, in the region yet. Uh, but the Australians for rigid ryegrass are seeing somewhere between a 40 and 80% reduction uh, in rigid ryegrass one year after, after doing this. And this is, a, this is actually wild radish here in this, this windrow. Um, so th there, there's that option. You know, this is, this is just a, a grower we work with. Uh, when I were just, was looking at the back of the machine to see how you might do this. And you know, so a lot of these machines, uh, some of these are going to be more complicated. We've got to be worried about airflow and let the combine breathe and not plug up. Uh, but some of these uh, 9, 000, older 9000 series John Deere's might be pretty easy to, to just get that chaff to just fall right there with very minimal modifications. You know, just, just unbolt the, the chaff spreader there. So this is a low cost of adoption. Uh, there's nothing to do after harvest, and so it's, it's pretty easy for uh, someone to give it a shot. All right, give it a try, see if it works. Uh, we don't have as much data on whether this is effectiveness. Uh, we are leaving the weed seeds in the field, right? So no, that's something in the, in the con column there. Um, is residue going to build up over time? I, I don't know. <laughs> I could kind of see that going both ways. I don't, I don't know what you guys think there. Uh, and then certainly planting into those chaff lines might be a concern. In, in Australia, you know, you're planting generally one crop a year where they're doing this, and so you've got a whole fallow period uh, over, over their winter to, for that uh, chaff material to break down and then plant through that the subsequent season, right? Uh, if we're doing that with wheat harvest and we're trying to double crop soybeans right after that, 
Uh, is that going to interfere with planning? Uh, are we concerned about that? Maybe that's just our sacrifice part of the field, and, and we're not worried about that. Uh, but, but certainly it's something to, to, to note, you know, if you want to adopt this. All right. Last thing, not really going to go into this, but, but direct bales is something they're doing in Australia where they have a market for the bales. On the eastern shore here, we, we were baling some of our wheat stubble, as you guys know. Uh, but we're dropping it on the ground first and then come back and picking it up later. And, uh, and I, I, and I see the lines of, of maybe Italian ryegrass through the fields because of, because of that. I, uh, I think this is a much better system at getting the weed seeds directly into that bale and hauled off the farm. Um, so versus dropping it on the ground, shaking those weed seeds out to the, to the ground, and then when that baler comes up, it's not going to pick up those weed seeds as well. Uh, certainly, this, guy, this is probably the most expensive piece of to do this with, but um, it can pay for itself if you have a market for those bales. All right, so those are the, the various types of harvest weed seed control. I guess the only other type I'm aware of that I probably should have mentioned was, was chaff tram lining. Uh, so if we go back to the, the, the chaff line here, uh, one thing, if you're on a controlled traffic farming system, right, if you're on tram lines, you could divert that chaff into those wheel tracks uh, with a little bit different, you know, you're not dropping it in the middle of the combine, you got to have some conveyor belts to move it out to the wheel tracks. But then you can run over those wheel tracks um, and run over those weed seeds there with subsequent operations in the field with your sprayer and so forth. So uh, so those, those are the various types. Any questions about that? All right, so can it work? You know, a valid question. Can it work? Uh, of what gets into the Harrington seed destructor of, of these four species, which, which some of our species we deal with, some not, um, but of what gets into the Harrington seed destructor, yes, we are uh, killing those weed seeds pretty effectively, 92 to, to 99 percent in this case. Uh, so the Harrington seed destructor does seem to be effective, and, and we've seen that. What do you see at the field level from, from one year of doing this? So if you put harvest weed seed control out in the field relative to not, what do you see the next year? In one year that they've seen basically across three different types of harvest weed seed control, the Harrington seed destructor, the chaff cart, and the arrow windrow burning, 55 to 60 uh, percent reduction in rigid ryegrass. And so again, that's a cousin of what we have to Italian ryegrass here in the States. But that's what, what they've seen in Australia. All right, so what have we done? Uh, some research shenanigans here for, for a little bit. Uh, this, this is basically our, um, our harvest weed seed control apparatus, if you will. Uh, so we've got a small plot combine, um, and we've just built this kind of chute to get, to get everything out of the back of the machine uh, into a trailer, and then you, you get a grad student in there to get chaff blown in their face, to rake, to rake everything on back. Uh, and once that thing fills up, we just go haul it off and, and dump it next to the woods. Um, so we are capturing everything that comes out of the back of the combine, all of the residue, right, with not just the chaff fraction. So if it made it to the combine, uh, we were removing it, so I, and I felt pretty good about that. We ended up kind of having to do some, some duct tape and some of that stuff once we got this thing out to the field. But I feel confident if the seed got in there, it got to the trailer, and it got hauled off the plot. All right, so we did this for three different weed species, uh, Italian ryegrass and wheat, and we've done this for uh, common ragweed and palmer amaranth in soybeans. And most of these, with, with one exception, this was, this was our on-station experiment, but these are all on-farm experiments and our plots were 30 feet wide by 100 feet long. So we tried to get, get a little bit bigger than we usually do to try to, to get more of a field scale here. But this was just plus or minus harvest weed seed control. We either harvested it with our device, that was the harvest weed seed control, or the, the grower came through with their, their combine uh, and, and, and did the strips. And so. Uh, here's kind of what you see where the residue was, was returned. It's a little bit dirtier, where we removed it, and the weed seeds therein, it's a little bit cleaner. So that was, that was our experimental setup here, uh, and this was just uh, continuous cropping, basically. So wheat followed behind wheat, or soybeans followed behind soybeans for, for whichever weeds we were looking at. Um, and so these were on farm. The growers just did their standard production practices in terms of herbicides, varieties, uh, et cetera. And the only thing that we changed was whether or not we, we did the harvest weed seed control. All right, so what did we find? Italian ryegrass, uh, first thing I'll talk about, how many seeds we had uh, at, on the plant at harvest time. When you, when you ramped this up to num the pounds of seed per acre, uh, we had a little, it wasn't significant, but we were somewhere around 200 pounds of Italian ryegrass seed per acre were up and on those plants at harvest time, right? 
And I think that's pretty significant. If you uh, told a, a grower you were going to come out there and spread 200 pounds of Italian ryegrass seed across their field per acre, they'd probably run you off with a gun, right? Um, but we're still running our combine through that. Um, for obviously good reason, we're trying to make some money here, but, uh, but there's, there was a lot of seed. Of course, we, we chose some fields that might have been a little bit higher than others for the purposes of this experiment, but, but we saw a lot of seeds when we harvested in 2017 out there. Um, in 2018, so, so this was the harvest after we, we put down the harvest wheat seed control or didn't the year before, before uh, we did have a reduction in number of seeds that were out there because we reduced the number of plants as, as that were out there. I'll show you that in a minute. But we still had uh, 40 pounds of seed out there per acre uh, that next year or 110 or so uh, where we didn't. So again, a lot of seed out there that we could try to target with this. And that's not accounting for what had already shattered uh, maybe before we got there. But there certainly was a lot of seed to, to target with it, with it. So these were the, the number of tillers, and this is Italian ryegrass tillers, not wheat tillers, but so the, the number of weed tillers April 12th when we came out there and sampled, right? So in the wheat production season, we either won or lost our weed control battle by this point, right? Um, and, and so you'll see what, what our effect was. We had three locations here, and that's what just the one, two, and three across the bottom is. And then the, the blue is the harvest weed seed control, right, where we removed the seeds the previous year, um, or just the conventional harvest where the seeds were returned the previous year. And what we found when you run numbers is we had a 28% reduction at one site, a 67% reduction at another site, and a no significant difference at the third site. So that was, that was one harvest. And, and I think it's important to note here where we didn't have a significant difference where we had the, the least amount of pressure, right? And so maybe that's what's driving that, but somewhere between uh, 30 and 70% reduction. That's kind of, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of what, what the Australians saw with rigid ryegrass in their wheat system. So is the juice worth the squeeze there? I don't know. You, t you tell me. <laughs> uh, I guess I, I would say that um, uh, certainly this is not something we're going to be doing in just one harvest, right? If you're going to buy a Harrington seed destructor, you're going to be running that through at multiple harvests. And so over time, as you further and further reduce that seed bank, assuming you get a timely harvest, um, that, that, that could compound over time potentially. Common ragweed, uh, so, so common ragweed soybean, uh, this is the number of plants there per square yard uh, prior to burn down. Uh, so before we put out the burn down herbicide, did we see a difference between those plots? Uh, and we did, a small difference, 16% reduction there, but it was statistically uh, significant. Uh, so 16% reduction in common ragweed at burn down. We came back prior to our post-emergence herbicide application, so we, all those plants were killed with the burn down. Um, and then sort of what kind of came up before we put the post-emergence application on. Uh, we again saw a, a reduction there where, har where the seeds through harvest wheat seed control the year before. In this case, 28% reduction. So I, I, don't, I think that's a you know, quarter of the seed uh, of what was out there what was, was removed. We came back at harvest um, and, this is, and we didn't see a significant reduction. I think that's when you see here the number of plants per square yard, we were less than one. Uh, so the post-emergence application, I think, was very effective. Common ragweed, as you know, has a big flush of germination earlier in the year. Not much is coming up later in the year. So this is, a, is totally surprising. If we got good kill with the post-emergence application, uh, over-the-top application, we didn't see a reduction, uh, significant reduction here at, at harvest. Right, so that's common ragweed. Palmer amaranth, uh, we, we, we didn't have this present at the burn down later in the year for us, but at the post-emergence application, uh, over the top application of soybeans, we had a trend toward reduction, but we did not see a significant difference there for Palmer. Moving ahead to the harvest, this is where we, uh, uh, we also did not see a significant reduction, but again, we had very few plants here uh, to look at, at at the harvest time. So Palmer amaranth is still, still a bit of a question mark. We, we haven't seen significant reductions trending that way. Maybe through multiple years we could get there, but, but at this time uh, you, you see the data. I want to come back and just kind of finish up with some of these other, other concerns. We've talked about nutrients just to kind of put some numbers on that. Uh, if we're removing the chaff and the straw, we're going to remove some of the nutrients that, that could break down in that residue and, and, and we need to account for that. So if it's a narrow windrow burning or, or we're bailing all of the residue, the chaff and the straw, you're talking 40-50% of, of that crop is in that. And so fractions of that are going to be nitrogen, potassium, et cetera. 
if it's just the chaff, we're talking 10 to 30 percent of our crop residue is, is being treated in, in one form or fashion, uh, either removed off the field or, or dropped, uh, condensed into that chaff line. About uh, 15 percent of that is, is fairly typical for wheat. Um, so, you know, if you think about when you're burning it, that nitrogen that's in there is going up in smoke. The carbon that's in there uh, and that has value is going up in smoke. The potassium there, the K, is going to remain in that ash, but it's going to be in a row, right, not spread out across the field. So those are, those are some concerns I think we need to, to take into account. Uh, what do these things cost? Uh, I would take these numbers with a grain of salt and, and maybe then some. Uh, this was from, from Weed Smart, which is kind of a, a real good resource for this information. They've really helped pioneer this sort of the extension equivalent. Uh, in Australia there. I basically took their numbers and I converted Australian dollars to American dollars and I converted hectares to acres. And so whether that translates from the other side of the world very well or not, I don't know. But just to, to, to give you an idea of what this is, so the capital cost, again, that integrated herring seed destructor is going to be pretty expensive. Chaff cart is going to be medium to that. Certainly the, the, the narrow window burning and the chaff lining is going to be pretty, pretty cheap to, to uh, modify the combine. The running cost, this is in terms of dollars per acre, and so it's going to vary by how many acres you're running across, right? You're running across more acres, um, you know, you, you're basically you're distributing the cost of that over a, a lot more uh, ground. This is based on uh, a 2,000 hectare farm, which is about 5,000 acres. So a lot bigger farms than we're probably used to here uh, in this part of the world. Uh, so this, these numbers are probably off by uh, two to three fold. You really should probably increase some of those numbers. Um, and then you see some of the nutrient removal costs there. If we're looking at 70 bushel wheat crop, uh, what those numbers turn out to be in terms of, of dollars per acre. So uh, when you look at these, though, uh, uh, you know, we're not, we're not unlike some of our herbicide applications, right, in terms of, of what it would cost to, to do this. And so um, can it make economic sense is sort of, again, we'll, we'll sort of see. We probably need some more research on it. But uh, it's, it's not out of, the, out of the ballpark, I think. All right, how do we make this thing uh, work? Just to wrap it up, like everything in agriculture, this is a lot easier if we just grow a good crop. Easier said than done, um, but, but there's reasons for that with harvest sweet seed control. If we have a good crop, uh, Italian ryegrass tends to lodge over, and so the wheat helps hold it upright and keep, gets the seeds up above that cutter bar. A uh, good crop also makes our weeds grow taller, all right? It's got to compete for light, and so our seeds are higher up in the air. Again, easier to get above that cutter. Bar, and, we, and we also produce fewer seeds when, when they're in competition. We've got to harvest on time. We talked about that. Um, the, the, the longer we wait to, to harvest that crop, the more seeds are going to shatter, uh, hit the ground, and not be subject to harvest weed seed control. So certainly get timely harvest is key. Uh, some of the stuff we did in 2016, we just got there too late, unfortunately. And so I didn't show any of that data because most of the seed had already shattered by the time we got there. So uh, certainly that's, I think, that rung rung true with some of our, our research. Harvesting low is important. Uh, we got to get those seeds above the cutter bar, and so we got to get that cutter bar down on the ground. Soybeans, we're pretty much doing that, uh, but for wheat, that's a consideration we need to make. Or um, if we're doing narrow windrow burning, we want to get more of that fuel uh, in, into, the, uh, into the narrow windrow. Some cases, we've got to adjust the combine, right? We've got to get the, uh, the seeds in that chaff fraction. Uh, and that can, that can be a headache, right? Because we also want to get as clean a grain as we can up into the grain tank. So um, lo looking at one of the resources from, from WeedSmart, they've got some videos on how to adjust a combine. Um, but, but some of the things they're doing here is they're, they're going to take out um, and, and open up the, the concave. So they might be taking out some of the, the wires in there. Uh, they might be opening up more. And they're, they're usually running that at a higher speed, basically the maximum speed. So the idea is that, is that anything that gets in there, as far as weed seeds go, it's quickly getting to the sieves. It's not staying in, in amongst that, that straw fraction for very long. Uh, the other modification, and not on every combine, but on certain combines, they've had to add a, a separator a baffle, just weld in a plate in there, try to, to make that, to, to keep the chaff from blowing up and into uh, that. So, not without its headaches, but certainly, like I said, if you, if you get it wrong, you could lose half your weed seeds in, in a fraction that you're not targeting. Um, if you get it right, you can get over 90% there. 
Uh, with that, I, I really need to acknowledge a lot of uh, support and help for this or from uh, equipment situ uh, situation from certainly the growers for letting us uh, complicate their lives around harvest time. I really appreciate uh, their, their, uh, their help and, and input in that. With that, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, so we didn't present the yield data because we didn't see any yield differences, um, it, which is a little bit disheartening to say that we, we did reduce the weed, seed, the weed population, but we didn't see yield differences between those. Uh, for the soybeans, I think you saw that in both of the common ragweed and the soybean, or the common ragweed and the palmer amaranth, our post emergence had a really good control. And, and as you know, soybeans can make up for that yield loss. So I think that's why we didn't see a yield difference there in soybeans. Uh, for wheat, I was a little bit surprised to see that we didn't get a yield loss or a difference there, um, but, but we didn't see a, a yield difference there. So, <laughs> yep, but, but a, a good question. The gentleman that, that runs the Harrington Seed Destructor at, at the Beltsville station was in here last time and, and he kind of shared some comments about uh, trying to make that work and they did ha initially have some setup issues. Uh, some things within the combine plugging up, trying to get the, the chaff into the Harrington Seed Destructor places where it is. So they, that's, I think, not without its um, pitfalls, if you will. So, you know, something like a chaff lining and just dropping it into a chute. Uh, it's going to be easier on some machines if we're, you know, kind of dampering down and not letting that air blow out of the machine and, and breathe like it needs to. Uh, we, might be, we might plug some things up. So you just got to recognize that going into it. Uh, Again, what I've heard from the Australians is that, yeah, there's, there's sort of a learning curve, trial and error to, to make this work, but they've, they've been successful in, in cases. And they're seeing about 40% adoption across the Western Australia grain belt with one of the forms of harvest wheat seed control. So I think that, that does show that at least they're finding it to be uh, economical, adoptable, uh, and, and hopefully profitable. 